Good afternoon. This is hearing number four of the 181st period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission entitled The Situation of Human Rights Within the Context of Protests in Cuba that was requested by a series of civil society organizations. My name is Julie Samantilla Falcon. I'm the first vice president of the commission. I am joined by the second vice president, Pia Flavia Piovesan, Commissioner Stuardo Ralon, the uh, country rapporteur and commissioner Joel Hernandez, the rapporteur for um, human rights defenders and justice operators. We also have the executive uh, secretary for monitoring, Ms. Pulido, the rapporteur for freedom of expression, Pedro Vaca, and the Redesca rapporteur, Soledad Garcia. This objective aims at uh, sharing the different patterns of human rights violations framed within the context of popular protests in Cuba on July 11th, 2021. Before we start with the hearing, I would like to uh, mention a couple of uh, methodology details. First of all, remember we have a digital tool on the platform that will be uh, measuring the time. We also have bilingual interpretation and subtitles. These hearings are broadcasted live via YouTube, Zoom, Facebook, and Twitter, and the recordings will be on the Commission's YouTube channel. With regards to the time distribution, as only the state organizations will be speaking and not the state of Cuba. We will begin with 30 minutes for the civil society. After that, please, you can distribute your time. The Inter-American Commission will be able to speak for 20 minutes, and then we will give the floor back to the civil society. So let's begin with these 30 minutes by the civil society. You have the floor. I don't know who's supposed to start. Oh, it's a video, okay. On July 11th, 2021, the people of Cuba came out to the streets to protest the government. This is what's happening here in Santiago. We here are calling all the revolutionaries in the country, all the communists in the country to take the streets wherever you are, where you see these provocations. I lost my daughter, my underage daughter. They took her. Freedom, freedom. Don't shoot people, they are women. We are not afraid. You are going to pay. You have women, you have children, you have families. MSI, free MSI. If you fall, I'll lift you up. Honorable commissioners, my name is Catherine Mujer Hernandez. I cannot activate my camera because I have a problem with it. I haven't been able to activate it. I'm a um, promoter of Cuba Decide. Our delegation is made up of various Cuban civil society organizations. We express deep concern over the serious human rights violations that have occurred and continue to occur today in our country in a year marked by the humanitarian crisis and the peaceful protests of the citizens. The largest of them took place on July 11, 2021, when hundreds of thousands of people peacefully took to the streets demanding the end of the dictatorship. The Complaint Center for the Foundation for Pan American Democracy registered demonstrations in at least 45 cities and towns, including all the capitals of the provinces. Citizens were strongly repressed by the state authorities, as well as by vigilante groups at the orders of the government, who exercises a disproportionate use of the force, arbitrary detentions, 
power outages and internet service blocking at the uh, Miguel Diaz Canel called his supporters to come back to face in the streets these demonstrations and threatened those who exercise the right to protest, stating that they would have to go over their bodies because they were ready for anything. The, the military in power deployed the elite group of the revolutionary armed forms to repress the population. On July 12th, Diaz-Canel said that the protesters had the response they reserved by encouraging hatred, stigmatizing the protest, and tacitly promoting the use of violence and confrontation between citizens. All actions are incompatible with the international standards to guarantee the right to protest and freedom of expression. The state and all public institutions have omitted any action to, for example, through the judicial system, investigate and sanction ex officio or at least a request to the hundreds of arbitrary detentions. In all cases, the state has failed to comply with the due process and with the minimum legal guidelines to warranty access to victims of arbitrary detentions uh, to justice. Of course, there have been no sanctions for those responsible for the violence that was uh, incited and ordered. The impunity with which the state exercises state terrorism against the citizenship is evidence in the cruelty against the beneficiaries of precautionary measures granted by the commission. For example, Jose Daniel Ferrer Garcia, uh, Umpacu coordinator beneficiary of precautionary measure in 2012, was arrested and disappeared for over three months on July 11th, a few meters from his home, when he tried to join the protests with his son, Jose Ferrer Castillo. The Provincial Prosecutor's Office of Santiago de Cuba imposed the same precautionary measure of provisional imprisonment. Um, um, his 18-year-old uh, son was released after six days while he is kept in isolation while waiting for judgment. There's also the case of Kaylee de la Mora, arbitrarily detained for 72 hours on July 11th, and to whom the commission granted precautionary protection measures in 2020 for being in a serious and urgent situation of risk of irreparable damage to her rights. And also Saili Navarro said uh, that the state carries out, uh, sorry, we'll say, uh, an intimidating strategy by publishing fiscal petitions for protesters on July 11, who reach up to 11, 18 years in prison. He has also announced the reactivation of the send of the convictions imposed on opponents such as Fernando Gonzalez, Saraga, and members of the UMPACU, um, who are promoters of Cuba de Sida, who received unfair sentences of between three and five years of home detention at the beginning of 2020. There's also a pattern that greatly worries civil society organizations in which the security forces have generated an environment of hostility by intimidating and attacking people who do not belong to any organized groups. They are citizens who, for the first time, have exercised their right to protest. As Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay expressed in our last public hearing, today more than ever, there's an urgent need for a global reaction of solidarity with the Cuban people. So we ask this honorable commission that it demands the release of all documented political prisoners, an end to violence and state terrorism against Cuban citizens. The representatives of the Cuban state lack legitimacy of origin and practice and are not prepared to be fair, much less to defend human dignity. Therefore, at 62 years of after 62 years of totalitarianism, totalitarianism, and when the crisis in my country reaches the humanitarian scale, we ask this commission to insist on exposing the Cuban situation to the Permanent Council of the Organization of American States. Thank you. On July 11th, my son and a group of young men uh, took to the streets asking for freedom. On July 16th, my son was detained. Several police officers came. They said they just wanted to talk to him, but they handcuffed him at the stairs of our house. I know by young, because of young men who were with them, who had been released, that my son was beaten. They also told me my son had started a hunger strike. On the 11th, when they got to the house, they started sending them threats, intimidation measures, because they were the heads of the protests. One of my cousins, Jorge, was uploading uh, videos uh, to Facebook before they cut the internet service. And then on the 12th, they um, detained on the street Nadir. They handcuffed him, they took him to the police station, they threatened them, they threatened him, they interrogated him for four hours, they released him, and on the 17th, they issued a subpoena. 
uh, they went peacefully and that was the last time we saw them um we spent over a week without an official notification of where they were how they were why they had taken them wherever they were after 62 days they granted them five a five minute phone call they didn't tell us where they was i went to several police stations looking for him until i found he was detained uh, at a special station it took about three days before he got in touch with me then on july 29 i saw my son after five days of a hunger strike on the 30th he uh, his lawyer saw him for the first time after 14 days of detention he never received medical assistance they accused him of uh, being rebellious i don't agree with that about two weeks ago, officially, for the first time, they let us know where they were at a maximum security prison in the uh, Kivikan town. It's a prison that's it's filled with political prisoners. Right now, he is in Combinado del Este. I've had to talk to a lot of people to find attorneys because of the um, accusations against my son. They said he had um, broken or he had uh, damaged a, a photo of Fidel. Now, during those 62 days, we didn't know about them. Uh, his attorney was unable to see him. He wasn't able to see them, to talk to them over the phone. He only says that they mistreat them, that they treat them like dogs. The attorney uh, filed petitions so that they would switch, uh, so that they wouldn't uh, have them detained without an accusation, without a trial. They were all denied. Then on September 22nd, the attorney finally saw him uh, in the prison. The trial took place on September 28th. He was handcuffed. There were police officers with dogs. There were um, black hat um, soldiers. There were a lot of police. Um, they tell us that they cried, but he never repeated what they want him to say. They want him to say, Viva Diaz Canel, Viva uh, Fidel, long live Fidel. They hadn't had any type of official communication, provisional prison up to the trial. Now we are waiting, we're still waiting for the trial. They were never able to see the file. They don't exactly know anything. Everything is uh, hearsay. We don't really know anything right now. When they, whenever they get two or five minutes to make a phone call, it's a very tense situation because when they listen to the children's voice, they get emotional. I asked the uh, Commission of Human Rights to intervene for the immediate release of my son. Because thinking for his own, that's not a crime. Thank you. Dear Commissioners, my name is Laritza Diversent. I am the director of Cubalex. Since July 11th, in collaboration with the uh, Justice Group 11J, um, we have recorded arrests, uh, over 1,000 1, arrests. Out of them, 572 remain deprived of liberty. Several released people denounce acts of torture and ill treatment, including beatings, verbal offenses, threats of sexual abuse, and the use of dogs to intimidate them. They were forced to undress and shout slogans in favor of the revolution, such as Long Live Fidel or Diaz Canel. According to a record, at least 33 people became infected with COVID-19 during um, the unfortunate hygienic uh, conditions and the overcrowding in the cells. We are concerned with people with chronic conditions, including HIV. We are, these people have reported the denial of access to medicines. We draw attention to the situation of five people with disabilities who are incarcerated and require psychiatric treatment. Several of the protesters were temporarily subjected to enforced disappearance. Cuba Legs heard of 40 
people about whom the authorities denied information about the place in which they were detained. We had access to 12 responses from the courts in which they never ruled on this serious violation, a systematic practice within Cuba that must be monitored to prevent its expansion and aggravation. We are concerned about the situation of invisibility towards certain social groups in vulnerable situations due to the lack of access to information on the situation of detainees and the fear of family members to report. Although some of these groups are not the most representative, the repression against them has been disproportionate to have an exemplary effect in their communities. We want with the, those belonging to civil society groups are perceived as critical of the governments and have been that has been decisive for the imputation of charges against them. We're concerned about the effects of refraction. At least 326 people are between 14 and 30 years old. 159 of them are still deprived of their freedom, including two minors under, who are under 16 and eight of them are over 16, but under 18. In these cases, the state has failed to comply with its obligation to apply the standards of justice for minors. 13 people between the ages of 60 and 75 were detained, and six people are still deprived of their liberty. Among them, the political activists, Carlos Manuel Pupo Rodriguez and Felix Navarro, who are 67 and 68. We have recorded the detention of 185 women. 61 of them are still deprived of liberty. Um, we would like to point out that there are single mothers whose situation has never been considered, especially those who have um, minor children or other relatives who, re uh, who require special care. According to the data obtained on the cases of Afro-descendants, 24% of them were released, compared to 40% of white-skinned persons. In a similar, the, the sim similar is a situation of five people who have a real or perceived sexual orientation or diverse gender identity. Another concern are the attacks that journalists received during the coverage of the protests to hinder the flow of information. Attacks were recorded against 18 journalists, five women and 13 men from eight independent media outlets and in various provinces. Although they were released, most of are subject to repeated illegal house arrests, a situation that is aggravated by the selective and deliberate cuts of the internet service. Finally, we would like to warn about the regulatory system implemented by the government to limit freedom of expression in the digital space. After the protests of July 11th, decree number 35 came into force, which legalizes massive cuts in the internet access and imposes the obligation on operators or providers of the public telecommunications system service to monitor the internet content. Under these regulations, the live broadcast of demonstrations or online calls for protests can be classified as harmful dissemination, cyber terrorism, cyber war, and social subversion. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Saeli Navarro, Honorable Commissioners. I come before you as a promoter of Cuba Decide, member of the Damas de Blanco, but especially as a daughter. Mm. My father, in July 12, Felix Navarro, he was arrested when he went to a police station to obtain information on the members of the party who had been arrested during the mobilizations. My father, Hours later, was released. He was transferred to the Combinado de Matanzas. On Saturday, 24, in a phone call that lasted four minutes, he mentioned that he was isolated, that he had become infected with COVID. My father, faces 15 years of a prison due to contempt. He was order to protect the life of my father. There are other activists 
who are also facing uh, criminal uh, cases. Montana, 65 years old, who was arrested and he is still in prison. Leila was also arrested. China Stevania Menendez, a 59 years old, who was who is also uh, detained. Samora, 24 years of age is also being, uh, was also arrested since, and uh, is in prison since uh, July the 12th. Jorge Serrano Alfonso, an activist of the movement of uh, democratic liberation was also detained in July 12th and taken to one of the uh, centers of torture he was tortured and beaten because he did not want to accuse anyone. The people of Cuba urgently needs the solidarity and the support of the government and democratic institutions. Listo. Uh, buenas tardes, honorables comisionados, relatores. Damas y caballeros, mi nombre es Michelle Matos. Commissioners, I am Michelle Matos. I am an activist of Movement San Isidro, an organization that was founded in um, in order to safeguard the rights of um, the citizenship of Cuba. We have um, documented 39 arrests of artists related to the protests, four of them sentenced in summary trial, charges of public disorder. Among them, um, Carlos Gonzalez Agosta and Angelo Troja. Likewise, preventive home detention was issued against at least 20 artists close to the San Isidro movement and 27N who protested in front of the Institute of Radio and Television. Added to them are the preventive prisons in chase against visual actors Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara in Guanajay prison charges um, due to incitement to commit a crime for calling to participate to the July 11 protests. And also he was accused of contempt, resistance and disobedience. And rapper Randy e. Arteaga, who is in prison the charge of uh, contempt and also suffers preventing detentions. The arbitrary detentions and abuse issue for pretrial prisons have been the resources used by Cuban governments to silence the dissents of the activists of the artists. In 2020, at least 22 filmmakers were arbitrarily detained by the police and the security and the state. And um, some of them have sub sentences, such as the rapper, member of the San Isidro movement, Denis Solis, arrested in November 11 last year, accused of the crime of content and sentenced to eight months in prisons. Uh, he also, uh, young Luis Robles for supporting um, himself and claiming freedom for Denis Solis, showing a simple poster in the street. He was arrested and with a request for six years in prison by the prosecution. The working group on arbitrary detentions of the United Nations ruled these two detentions are radically arbitrary. Since the campaign against Decree 349, the artists of the San Isidro movement have suffered constant harassment from the government, arbitrary arrest, confiscation of works, prohibition of leaving the country, systematic um, blockades in communications, denial of access to essential services such as health or housing. To emblematic examples of this type of execution, of persecution. The actress Iris Ruiz uh, was denied basic health checks for which she had to migrate to ask clinical treatment. The artist Afri Reina has also evicted several times from her home together with her two-year-old son. Among the members of the San Isidro movement, the rapper Michael Castillo, interpreter of Patria y Vida, suffered at least nine arrests and was subject to home surveillance 
from April uh, to May 2021. On this date, he was arrested, and for 14 days, he was a victim of um, forced disappearance. On June the 3rd, the authorities reported that he was in the Pinar del Rio prison for an open investigation that charges contempt, resistance, and disobedience for having sung the song Patria a y Vida. Throughout 2021, Luis Manuel Antero Alcantara suffered systematic harassment for the regime that included the destruction of his works of art, house arrest, and at least 14 occasions, 16 arbitrary arrests, and the police siege of his house while he was on a hunger strike, and the medical admission against his will in the Calixto Garcia University Hospital for 29 days. On June 26, Hamil Lavastia, resigning from Berlin, was arrested and transferred to Villa Marista on charges of incitement to crime after proposing in a public chat the action to artistically intervene banknotes using slogans as a way of expressing dissent. On September 26, he was released in exchange for him and his partner, poet Catherine Biscuit, and uh, left the country on the premise of not returning. Today, both artists are exiled in Poland. Art historian Carolina Barrero has been under siege from state security forces for belonging to the group 27N. She was accused of illegal printing. Since March 25th, she uh, was under house arrest for more than 150 days, and she was detained more than 10 times. These are some of the visible examples of the attacks that human rights defenders are subject to on the island. Thank you for your time and attention. I give the floor to my colleague. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Osvaldo Navarro Veloz, artist and activist of the Citizens Committee for Racial Integration and coordinator of the Culture and Community Program Diverso. The CIR, as part of the public agenda, has continued monitoring um, the situation with a focus on the human rights situation of Afro descendant people, young, the youth, women, artists, and other diversity. Uh, starting we after the uh, protests that took place in July 11 and 12. An unprecedented element was notorious in each of the 60 points where the popular protests were registered. Um, the Cuba, the one that supposedly had benefited from the revolution, also took to the streets to demand the rights. The protests had a deceased Dubis Laurencio Tejeda, 36 years old, black, poor, resident in one of the most impoverished areas of Habana, was killed by a bullet from an agent, police agent, and then prevented, presented before the national public opinion as a criminal. There were several crises that ignited the engine of popular disagreement reflected in the streets on July 11th and 12th. The crisis of political confidence towards the state and the institutions, the income crisis that is connected with the reconfiguration of poverty and inequalities, the health crisis, the economic crisis, and the crisis of civil and political rights. Each of these affects in a differentiated way and to a great extent the Afro-descendant population. The criminalization of the Black subject became visible in each of the audiovisual narratives that were amplified from the official apparatus, presenting the protesters as criminals and mercenaries, since official policy has identified the events as part of the conventional war in the uh, of the United States against Cuba. In our cultural program, Diverser, we have follow up uh, the artists detained after July 11th and the arbitrariness committees uh, against artists who are members of our organizations. In the case of Randy Artera Rivera, a rapper who resides in the province of Villa Clara, the case of alleged public disorder was changed to that of alleged resistance to authority. He's currently imprisoned in uh, La Pendiente Prison. Fernando Menares Rivera, member of the C. I R was arrested and interrogated by the political police in the seventh unit in La Lisa on October the 9th. He was threatened with the Greek law 35 with, um, for being prosecuted for making publications showing the faces of state agents. He was also threatened to put him in a cell at the station to beat him. I want to report the harassment of state security towards me. After the protests of July 11 and 12, I was arrested on July 21st, um, in the middle of the public road, together with the activist Marta de la Tamayo, I was kidnapped by uh, police agents and state security in, on September 24 and October the 3rd. 
he, there was a wave of repression unleashed against Afro-Cuban activists who are members of the Council for Democratic Transition in Cuba. I want to thank the Commission for the precautionary measure granted to Richard Adrián Zamora Brito, and I urge the Cuban government to fully implement it to ensure that we, the beneficiaries, can carry out our activities as human rights defenders without being subjected to acts of violence, intimidation, and harassment. Finally, the CIR wants to uh, highlight and draw the attention of the Commission to the systematic criminalization and consequent rationalization of civic protests in Cuba in an attempt to distort the accumulated demands of the most marginalized sectors of Cuban society. The support of the entire inter-American system is vital. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Martela Tamayo. We, I am part of the Council for the Democratic Transition and part of Citizens Committee for Rational Integration. We want to request the Commission to publicly remind the state of Cuba regarding its duty to respect human fundamental rights of those participating in this thematic uh, hearing so that they can continue their work as human rights defenders, including freedom expression of their ideas and thoughts without being subject to um, violence and harassment. By doing a public pronouncement regarding the response provided by the Cuban state in connection with the peaceful uh, protest that will take place in November, taking into account our right um, regarding uh, right to protest and freedom of expression. We want to ask the Cuban government to have a dialogue with the um, activists, include the information presented during this thematic hearing in annual report and to continue to include Cuba in chapter 4B, to urge the Cuban government to sign and ratify the American Convention on Human Rights and other instruments of the inter-American system and the uh, inter-American democratic charter and to join the Organization of American States under the criteria agreed upon in resolution 2438 of 2009 of the General Assembly. Request uh, the Cuban government uh, in local visit in order to verify the status of persons deprived of liberty, to prioritize the granting of precautionary measures for those persons whose fundamental rights have been affected um, due to their participation in the peaceful demonstrations with the Cuban government for the full implementations of these measures. Remain aware not only of the practices that constitute human rights violations, but also of the criminal proceedings against protesters, especially those in a situation of vulnerability, and also to convene a high level meeting with Cuba and the Inter American system to follow up the requests and start a process of dialogue between the Commission, the Cuban government, and the Cuban organizations. Thank you. Thank you for your, uh, the valuable information that you have provided in this hearing. We will now start for 30 minutes the participation of the Commission. Firstly, I will ask the country reporter, Commissioner Rallon, whether he has any comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, Madam First Vice President, I want to greet my colleague commissioners and especially greet the representatives of the different organizations and the persons who are present here today. I want to acknowledge the effort and the courage of the work you carried out under such um, difficult conditions. I want to mention first of all that as country rapporteur and part of the commission and our special rapporteurs on freedom of expression and social economic culture environmental rights we are carrying out a teamwork 
that is carried out, taking into account the rules of the Commission and taking into account the human rights situation in Cuba. For us, this is very important. And we have created a line of work. We have um, made, uh, issued several press releases. We have used the social media platforms such as Twitter. Um, every time we are able to make visible uh, the duties of the state of Cuba regarding human rights. I would also like to mention that, bearing in mind this complex situation that you are living in the island, I have specially expressed as a rapporteur that when the situation, the human rights situation in Cuba is addressed at international level, Sometimes there are certain groups that put emphasis on one part of the problem that has many angles and has to do with the economic embargo. But within the Commission, we have expressed and we have focused on the fact that these are two different situations. We cannot argue that economic embargo is the reason we had the situation that is related to the violation of the fundamental freedoms and guarantees and fundamental human rights of the citizens. The D cause is different. There is no freedom, there is no democratic regime, and as long as that cause is not addressed, it could be very difficult to make progress to guarantee the fulfillment of human rights. That's why peaceful protests are taking place spontaneously in by different parts of the citizenship, voices, civil society organizations manifest, make visible the fact that there is a need to make a change, to have a democratic, um, system in the island. I would also like, we have taken down notes of what you have mentioned, your requests, and we are deeply concerned by monitoring these contexts. What you have mentioned, that is to say a violation to due process and convictions that are aimed at hindering the expression of free thinking and the right to process to protest. These kind of summary trials that lack guarantees, we see that there are um, convictions, 18 years of prison, just because they are exercising, exercising the right to protest, they should be guaranteed. And persons are being punished in order to stigmatize, to um, avoid the expression of those voices requesting those changes and those freedoms. In that context, the movement of artists in the island has been key as these are voices that with creativity have had peaceful protests seeking that openness. And today we have heard that many of them have suffered, uh, have been tried, uh, suffer home detention or await prosecution um, in order to impede the peaceful manifestation and mobilization as it should happen in any democratic uh, society. In order to conclude, I would like to highlight the commitment of the Commission to continue making this situation visible. And we have issued uh, joint press releases with the special uh, rapporteurships. The last one had to do with the internet interruption and a lack of access to social media in order to repress 
uh, protest and undoubtedly beyond the press release we will make after the 181st period of session, I will propose my colleagues to assess issuing a press release specifically focused on guarantees to due process and the um, disproportionate convictions to punish uh, the right to protest, as you have mentioned. We will keep on giving priority to the precautionary measures requests. This is one of the mechanisms the Commission has and which has used in order to protect and make visible these situations when the uh, state um, does not provide a response. We know that the state is isolated from the uh, inter-American system. So uh, these measures uh, allow us to protect a person whose life is at risk and make this uh, in internationally visible. Basically, we will continue carrying out this task and I want to thank you for the information you have provided that help us complete the information that we already had after our uh, task of monitoring. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to ask uh, Ms. Flavia Piovesan if she has any comments or questions. Thank you very much. First Vice President, yes. Um, I'd like to express my solidarity with the Cuban, the people of Cuba, and my acknowledgement and respect, as the country reporter was saying, Commissioner Stuardo, because of the bravery of the three, 23 organizations that have allied in the fight for the rights and justice, expressing once again our full commitment to activating all the mechanisms, as my colleague was saying, to precautionary measures, uh, well, the entire monitoring um, work to visibilize and uh, these serious violations to human rights. I have three questions. The first one is as a rapporteur for LGBTI persons. Are, there are uh, reports of sexual abuse, sexual abuse perpetrated within the context of the protests of July the 11th, but also um, during the detentions. All the information that was shared was very valuable, but my first question is, do you have disaggregated data with regards to the one 572 persons who are still deprived of their liberty. Another important thing, thing that would be important for the commission is having the number of victims of forced disappearances. I paid a lot of attention to the situation of adolescents, of older persons, and also to racial violence. So it would be important to know if there's more specific information or disaggregated data. My second question, and it goes uh, along the same lines as those of the country rapporteur, in order to characterize the arbitrariness of the um, state, is the, I mean, there we see systematic violations of uh, political and civil rights uh, and the criminalization of dissidents, uh, arbitrary detention, sexual abuse, torture, all from um, legal language with open um, legal types. So I think it would be important, even if we think of this future uh, press release, it would be good to have more information about the 572 cases of detention and to know if they are using these types 
a more general perspective. And finally, I took, uh, I paid attention to the case of impunity, but once again, as part of all this brutality of the arbitrary behavior of the state, this abusive relationship, reaction, sorry, a disproportionate reaction, wasn't there even one investigation, just generalized impunity? And finally, um, there's a proposal for um, table for dialogue and the new protest of November 15. I would like to know a little bit about this outlook, this horizon with regards to November 15th, about the proposal for this uh, table for dialogue. Thank you, Madam President. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Hernandez. Yes, thank you, Madam President. I don't have actually questions. The presentation was very detailed and my colleagues, Commissioners Pio Besan and Ralon made very accurate questions for the um, petitioners, but I would like to use the floor to express a couple of ideas. First of all, I would like to mention my acknowledgement as well to this um, civil society group to, because they came to the commission and presented accurate information about what took place during the manifestations, during the protests of uh, Ju July 11th. The lack of participation of Cuba in the inter-American system um, prevents us from carrying out a visit as was suggested by you, but through this monitoring, this remote monitoring we perform sometimes, that is how the commission becomes aware of the general developments. And they are very concerning because it is obvious once again that there are no democratic spaces. And what I mean to say here is that there's a prevention of the exercise of the right to defend rights. This right that human defenders have, human right defenders have, which is a capital right in order to exercise other rights, in order to um, defend rights, it is required that the state protects and warranties associated rights. The first one and most important one is the respect to life and integrity of people, of human rights defenders. As, and you have expressed very concerning cases. But also in order to defend the right to defend rights, um, there's a need for freedom of association, freedom of expression, the right to um, information. These rights that within the framework of these protests were violated. Without these rights, it is impossible to um, exercise the right to defend rights. And here the state works against an emerging right, which is becoming consolidated, which is the one that allows human rights defenders to perform social control, to be uh, speakers, to be the voice of the needs of the people. So that is what concerns us the most at the commission um, in order to continue to do our work we have received reports on human rights of course but also our work is to protect through the um, mechanisms available to the commission i really like the way my colleague commissioner ralon expressed the impact of precautionary measures of the commission but if we are realistic, we know that unlike 
other countries where there is collaboration from the state, precautionary measures, once they are issued, um, yeah, the product of they needed to consensus between the petitioner and the state. And here we don't have that. We don't have that cooperation, that dialogue. We don't have an answer from the state to the requests for information. And of course, uh, there's no agreement with the petitioners, but it is a way to visibilize the situation, the human rights situation of a, a group that's particularly concerning. That is why when we receive requests, the commission performs an analysis of the petitions and issues these measures that always go hand in hand with the press release and that allows us to shed light on the situation of how people are at risk or uh, in the middle of an emergency and to raise awareness about the situation. That is what I wanted to say, Madam President. And I wanted to say that um, from the rapporteurship uh, for uh, the rights of human rights defenders, um, we continue to defend this human right to defend human rights. Thank you, Commissioner. Before giving the floor to the rest of my co of our colleagues in the commission, um, I am the first vice president, and I would like to say a couple of things and ask for some information. First of all, I would like to um, back what the, my colleagues said, especially what my, the country rapporteur said about our commitment to continue to um, support your work, which is a beacon of hope for Cuba, but also for the region. And along those lines, um, with regards to what uh, Commissioner Piovesan said about this differentiated uh, vision. I am the rapporteur for older persons, so I am concerned about the impact of older, uh, of the, the impact this is having on older persons, especially um, daughters uh, who sometimes need to fight for justice uh, for their parents. And another thing uh, is that um, you didn't get a chance to speak more about women. So I would like you to tell us about the particular situation of women. And now with regards to sexual violence, I'm thinking along the lines, the guidelines of the um, jurisprudence of the court, especially the court at Tenco v. Mexico, when the court said how sexual violence against women was an action that was part of the state's repression. This was not casual. There was a system. These were coordinated actions. That is why I wanted to ask more detailed information about sexual violence as a form of repression. Having said this, I would like to ask um, Deputy, um, to ask Secretary Pulido if she has any questions. Yes, thank you, Madam Vice President. First of all, I would like to greet everyone who has taken part in this hearing, who have presented such important information. And with regards to what's said, Article 636 of the Rules of Procedure of the Commission establishes warranties for those who participate before it in hearings and says that states cannot uh, try witnesses or um, punish them because of uh, their actions with the commission. The commission pays a lot of attention to this and uh, mentioned this every uh, always at the end of these um, hearings and might even issue precautionary measures ex officio. We are also working on two reports, one about the human rights situation. And here we are focusing on giving a voice to those people, to the voiceless. As the mother of the person who was detained, thinking for your own is not your, it's not a crime. And that is the kind of statement that the commission includes on its reports, um, basing it on the Inter-American 
um, regulations and then uh, prepares recommendations. And the recommendations that were presented here today will be taken into account on this technical report. And uh, with the rapporteurship for ESE rights, we're working on a report about work and union rights just so in order to have a supplementary perspective to all the work, the follow-up work that we're seeing on civil and political rights. That's all for me, Madam Vice President. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the rapporteur for freedom of expression, Pedro Baca, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, First, uh, Madam First Vice President. First of all, I would like to greet and acknowledge all these organizations that attended this hearing, the our rapporteurship is very much aware of how difficult it is to gather documentation, especially in Cuba, about the human rights situation. And we know about the methods and the evidence that are presented in this hearing. And in a moment when there's so much mystery about how the uh, state addresses human rights. This is very valuable. So I would like to encourage you to keep on uh, doing that wonderful work. And another thing, I wanted to talk about two things. First one, the warranties for freedom of expression on the internet, because you have reported that is precarious, but there was a couple of adjustments that were presented and the criminalization of uh, freedom of expression as understood in a broad sense, not only with regards to the media, but also what might be considered any voice of dissidence, the um, special rapporteurship for freedom of expression on its report about Cuba, our first conclusion is that there are no sort of warranties to that to this right. This report is two years old, and the uh, situation of the past couple of months just confirms the lack of those warranties. And I have a couple of questions, Madam President, if that's okay. Our rapporteurship is documenting the um, inhibitory effect these few months might have had. I would like to ask you about self-censorship, whether this has generated fear, even in the documentation you are sending us. And another thing I wanted to ask about was uh, reported at this hearing, but I would like to get more details now or maybe in a written form after this hearing. This, uh, um, this, domain, uh, this uh, home arrests or home um, lockdowns where people are locked down inside their own houses, what is there any sort of regulation? This is done under, within the uh, legal structure of Cuba. And number three, this has to do with the protests that will be, that will be occurring in the next weeks. I think this is a good opportunity to share with the commission the um, possible scenarios. As far as we understand, our rapporteurship believes that there has been some sort of response to the announcement that you will be protesting. So we believe that this might become worse. We already saw repression in July. So what might happen now in November? And my final question has to do with you. How do you feel about the work of reporting these events? How do you feel about the warranties for your actual work? Because this has to do with freedom of expression as well. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to ask the ESEER rapporteur, Soledad Garcia, to uh, share her comments. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet the commission our colleagues from the Executive Secretariat, the Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, and everyone taking part in this hearing. It's, an, it's a true honor to have the chance to address you very briefly and ask a couple of questions. First of all, I'd like to express my solidarity with the people of Cuba. Um, I believe the um, people of Cuba is demanding on the streets freedom, but also dignity. And as, as the country rapporteur expressed, Commissioner Rallon, 
our commission is trying to give a more comprehensive answer to the analysis of the situation of human rights in Cuba. And that has a lot to do with my mandate. Um, we had the chance to make pronouncements about a couple of concerning situations, as is the case of the situation of the right to food, of cultural rights, and in particular, as was expressed by uh, Ms. Pulido, we are also working on a report on labor and union rights. Please um, pay attention to this because it will be launched soon. We'll be launching a questionnaire to gather information. Of course, this is not easy in Cuba, we know, because it is very difficult for us to access the ground and i would like to express our concerns about the right to food and the access to health and how all these is uh, making the protest environment even worse so i would like to know what you think about this and especially because we are concerned about the inflation, which also affects access to essential goods in Cuba. We are also concerned about academic freedom, about the situation of professors and students who are also repressed in their job. They are even incarcerated. And we would also like to have all the uh, disaggregated information that you have um, about collectives that have to do with my mandate as educators, health staff, artists. And with that in mind, finally, I would like to express our deepest concern about the situation of the cultural rights in the island, an island which is, uh, which is a cultural power because it has given so much to the world in all the arts. So we are very much concerned that potentiality in culture of Cuba might be weakened or undermined. So you have all our solidarity and our commitment to follow up on the situation of Cuba. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Rapporteur. I will now give the floor once again to the civil society so that you can conclude your presentation and react to the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable members of the commission for your interest in the hum about the human rights situation in Cuba, for your words of solidarity and your questions. We will answer them, taking into account the time that we have, and we will also send uh, written information in order to reply them in detail. Before giving the floor to my colleagues, I would like to highlight that one of the participants uh, in Cuba was not able to participate, to participate, Manuel Cuesta Murua. His house has been sieged by the police and, you, and his internet connection was interrupted at 2 p.m. So, we will now reply to your questions. I will now give the floor to Clarissa Diversend to mention the situation, um, uh, situation of the elderly, sexual violence, home detention, and other questions related to the Cuban normative. Also, Marta de la Tamasha, who will also offer more information about the situation of women and to reply uh, everything related to the protest that will take place in November. And Michelle Matos, who will answer the questions about censorship. Gustavo Osvaldo Navarro, we will talk about the experience of being a human rights defender in Cuba today. Thank you. Regarding the uh, detailed data 
that you have requested. We keep on working on the documentation, on gathering documentation about the persons detained after uh, July. The speaker is muted. You are muted, Laritza. I am sorry. I had already answered your question. I'm sorry. I was saying that we keep on gathering information about the situation of the persons that were detained. And we are trying to gather information, but that is very hard. And I will answer some of the doubts that you have. It is very hard because of the fear of the relatives hiring lawyers and the families have been advised not to uh, resort to civil society organizations and this shows the situation of vulnerability we have received complaints regarding sexual violence we know that women have suffered in a disproportionate way we do not have evidence of direct physical violence but we do have records of threats and other kinds of abuses women mothers are the ones in charge of the cases of the relatives, their sons, and they are threatened by the officials, by the authorities, because they are the ones uh, fighting for the defense of their sons. We do not have information regarding this sexual violation. We lack that information in Cuba, but we're making an effort to make that situation visible. Regarding the crimes, we are gathering information, but two weeks ago, the Office of the Prosecutor started uh, issuing information, and we know that the crimes are quite serious. There are convictions that go from six months to many years, one of the persons that appeared in the video, he was notified his conviction, he is deprived of his liberty because he has participated in a protest and he had a painting of Fidel Castro. And sometimes uh, some persons are punished with 25 years or 18 years of prison, um, being accused of uh, contempt, for example but more than 40% are being uh, convicted for two or three crimes at the same time. That is why convictions are longer. For example, resistance to arrest or contempt. And we will provide that detailed information to the commission as soon as we receive it. Regarding home detention and the lack of freedom of expression, that um, is a pre-trial measure that is imposed to the person detained. And that person gets freedom uh, in order to wait for uh, his or her trial in, while being free, but there is continuous surveillance in front of their houses. That happens uh, in the case of human rights defenders and journalists. So the agents of the Ministry of the uh, Interior do not have uh, any legal authority to apply these measures. This is related to a criminal proceeding, it is regulated in our legislation. And I want to highlight that the protesters that have been detained, those that have been excarcerated, uh, some of them are awaiting prosecution. 
We want to insist that these persons did not commit any crime. They exercise the right to protest and all the uh, convictions are unjust. The uh, convictions are unfair and illegal. I will now give the floor to my colleagues. Good afternoon, commissioners, to the special rapporteur. My name is Madrazo. I coordinate the uh, Citizen Commission for Racial Integration in order to recognize the rights of our descendants in Cuba with the aim of showing the human rights situation in Cuba against uh, Afro-descendant citizens. During the popular protests in July, there was an important participation, a presence of Afro-descendant women, young persons, especially persons who live in that deep Cuba that is marked by inequality and extreme poverty the so-called uh, tax to uh, provide order have deepened the situation and there is an accumulated violence in the Cuban society. This has occurred for more than 60 years and this has nothing to do with the embargo. There is a counter embargo that has been produced by the power itself. And during the exercise of um, peaceful protests in July, we noticed a trend towards the criminalization of black subjects, especially after descendants in media outlets in media outlets in particular, the TV was focused on the popular neighborhoods and in order to, pull, to show the um, clashes between the police, uh, the rapid response brigades, and the armed um, forces against the citizens. And there was also verbal violence uh, with a, a stereotype, a stigmatization component in general. In that socialist narrative, they have developed the idea that the black persons are uh, targets of repression, the criminalization, and by the police has been heavier than that of other institutions. And the Andaya, the rapper and musician, has been detained since uh, July. As my colleague mentioned, he's in La Pendiente prison. He, the rapper, the only thing he did was to express himself. He did not attack any officials but he is being charged with contempt and public disorder um, charges. Also a student of the University of La Habana, of the School of History, he went to the street that day to protest with a sign that said more socialism, less repression, but he also suffered from the repression as any political activist opposing the system. That is to say, against all the civil society actors beyond the ideology, the Cuban society suffered the weight of repression, arbitrariness, and great part of the Afro-descendant population is still suffering in the base of the uh, social pyramid. The uh, Cuban economy affects in particular the Afro-descendant population and the universal measures that are related 
to access to health and education do not cover that need in the Cuban society. The crisis has been reinforced regarding the public safety of human rights activists and the citizenship in connection with the protests that will take place in November the 15th. There are arbitrary detentions, police operations against human rights defenders and constant surveillance uh, to those who through social media were also uh, expressing in favor of the protests. Also university teachers, professors, and also professors in educational centers who are also supporting the, the protests in November, also health um, staff have suffered these arbitrary detentions against the possible demonstrators or citizens. So we are going through a very difficult situation. The official narrative is that what will take place in the next days has to do with the change of regime. It is the responsible of the United States. It is related to um, subversive groups and that is affecting the whole um, Cuban society. Marta Dela, you have the floor. As my colleague Laritza was saying, we will be sending information to the commission, but we could like to say that civil society groups, Alianza for la Inclusión, we have follow up political violence against uh, female activists, human rights defenders, before and after the events uh, that took place in July. This repression escalates and includes arbitrary detentions, harassment. We are concerned about the cases that I wanted to mention. The sisters Garrido, who are human rights activists, and they are awaiting their trial. They are charged with um, contempt resistance to arrest, among other charges. Another case about which we are concerned, a person that was detained in July 22nd and is uh, awaiting prosecution due to charges at, uh, such as sabotage. And also Reyes, who was given a warning letter after the protests in July and after she tried to take her request um, for the protest in November the 15th. That activist was beaten. She was taking her phone. She was beaten, brutally assaulted just because she presented to the municipal government in Santiago de Cuba this request. That is of great concern and we want to denounce that situation. We will be sending you this information in connection with the events that will take place in November the 15th. We are concerned about the position of women we have fostered all these causes. We have signed the declaration, declarations to request the authority for this uh, November, and we have been harassed. We have been detained. We lack access to the internet. And we have been mentioned this for a long time, and uh, we are really deeply concerned. Michelle, you have the floor. Thank you. Because we don't have much time, I'm going to be brief. I'm going to say something 
uh, obvious. This is a totalitarian country. The government, the party, that is one thing, um, say the life of this nation. Regarding arts and culture, censorship and repression exists since the uh, beginning of the revolution. The cultural policy in Cuba uh, is quite clear. Fidel Castro said, within revolution, everything outside the revolution, nothing. Benito Mussolini said uh, words that were quite similar in order to defend the fascist state. I would like to highlight that some uh, specific uh, artists, Alcantara, De Montes, Pica, have been beaten in the street because they have tried to uh, have a show, a concert in November 2018 within a house. And this fostered the development of San Isidro movement. We wanted to have a concert within uh, Manuel's house and we were beaten, we were censored and we were spit in different events Tania Bruera was also beaten in her face. I was separated from the group. I was given to special forces. I was handcuffed. And one of them decided to almost fracture my thumb. Um, I couldn't move my hand for two weeks. And this was um, arbitrary. What we try to do uh, has to do with our ex artistic expression through our works of parts. Also, the exacerbation of hatred in social media, in uh, media outlets against persons like us. They use uh, private uh, documents to expose their uh, sexual uh, preference or they. Uh, different behaviors that we may have with a partner. This is used in order to um, prevent other persons from joining these kind of voices. I participated in the YAOAS summit in Panama and the Ministry of Culture de Pietro said that culture is the battlefield and we have to fight there. If one of you remember the behavior of the Cuban delegation during that summit was to uh, shout at us, to beat us, and this delegation behaved in a very savage way. And our conclusion was that the Cuban government didn't want to have a dialogue uh, with uh, the enemy within its narrative. These are brief examples of censorship, of kidnapping. And one more thing, when an artist carries out or creates a work of art, not only the work of art is censored, but that artist as well is censored indefinitely. He may be uh, suffering from censorship from a couple of years or for their lives. And that is why they are ostracized. That's all. Thank you. Good afternoon once again. With regards to how it feels to work denouncing these facts and the warranties for our work as activists, well, I think my colleagues have been they have given several examples about this. I'd like to just quote or uh, to remind you of the fact of the racialization of uh, the protests by the Cuban state, because I think that in terms of activism, I myself as an activist, that is an extra. I'm gonna give you uh, one example. Uh, and last November, we took part in a um, protest and the main attacks, apart from the um, regular, unfortunate, unfortunately, um, repression, were addressed at Blacks, uh, they would say, 
uh, you black counter revolutionary, you should thank the revolution because it has given you everything. So activists suffer repression, they have no warranties to carry out their work. And in the case of our, of our descendant activists, there's an extra danger. That's what I, I wanted to, to mention. Thank you. Finally, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Rosa Maria. Rosa Maria, please. Thank you very much, Cristina. I'd just like to say once again how important it is to, yes, you need to pay attention, but we also need to give a voice to the um, people of Cuba. I think that thanks to the amazing work of these organizations, we have seen how vulnerable they are right now. There are calls for the um, November 15th protest. The state has started firing from their jobs all those people asking for permission to attend that protest. Katerina was talking about the words of um, Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay during the past hearing. She said, it's important to have a world reaction in solidarity with the people of Cuba. Now it's time for that reaction to arise. I would like to thank the commission for the effort of um, presenting this situation to the permanent council of the OAS to ask them to keep on insisting on um, revealing of disclosing this reality to the permanent council. We need the voice of all the state members because they all have the responsibility to protect the peoples of the Americas and alive and the right to live in democracy. Thank you. Okay, then that's it for the civil society. We are reaching the end of this hearing for the Inter-American Commission. It's an honor to have been here with you all. And we would like to say once again, how thankful we are not only for your being here today, but for your daily work, for uh, your wearing down the exposure and all the situations you have presented. The inter-American system was created by the agreements of the state with a fundamental objective, the protection of human rights and dignity. And along those lines, the inter-American commission is very much aware of this, as was pointed out by the country rapporteur. Please rest assured that the commission is there with you and will always be there with you through all our mechanisms, press releases, our precautionary measures. And we have paid attention to all of your petitions, including the request to include on chapter 4B of the annual report, your um, presentations. We are very serious about each of your requests. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts because you are not alone. We are here with you. You can count on us. And as Commissioner Hernandez was saying, it's not the same as in as with other states because we can carry out in local visits there, but the commission and each of the commissioners and the special rapporteurs and the executive secretariat and all the officials of the commission are very much aware of Cuba and are always thinking of all of you, of Cuba and all of those who, uh, because of fear or repression cannot express. You um, can count on the uh, commission and our permanent and total commitment. Once again, I thank you and we will close this hearing now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias.